Okay, uh, I'm uh, Reed Kramer. I direct the Asset Building Program here at the New America Foundation, and I want to welcome you all here to this event uh, this afternoon on the politics of inequality, uh, featuring two veteran Washington reporters, David Korn and Tim Noah, uh, and their new books, uh, which together will give us a couple of vital um, entry points into the topic of uh, inequality. And I think I'm supposed to announce for those in Twitter land, the hashtag inequality is uh, yours. Uh, so my colleagues and I in the asset building program focus a lot of our work on uh, advancing public policies that help families uh, move forward in their lives uh, economically. Uh, we're interested in the tools and the policies and the resources that help people move up the economic ladder. Now, the, the advent of the Great Recession uh, clearly focused um, our attention not only on the issue of economic security, but also on uh, the distribution of, of resources that can either impede uh, or facilitate this upward climb. And uh, leading up to the recession, it was pretty clear that the trend lines didn't look particularly good. Uh, there's many different ways to measure inequality, but almost undeniably, it had been increasing for a number of years. Uh, poverty had been fairly persistent with some fluctuations, but, but median wages had stagnated, and it was very clear that there was a, a divorce from productivity gains that were no longer going to increase wages in the middle. Uh, meanwhile, the, the share of the, the very upper income folks at the very top uh, the stinking rich, as uh, Tim calls them, uh, they were increasing their share of, of total uh, income, and uh, their tax burden was going down. So it's kind of a natural and important question to ask if inequality is linked and connected to the performance of the economy, uh, and if it is, what we can do about it. And uh, then whether or not the next question is whether or not we have the political process in place that can get us over the hurdles. Uh, and I think that today's discussion is going to be helpful to those uh, questions. We're going to dig into the politics and the policies of inequality. Uh, we have Tim Noah uh, with us, who's currently a columnist at the New Republic. And previously, when he was at Slate, he wrote a very important 10-part series on inequality that became the foundation for his book. Uh, his first book, uh, The Great Div Divide, Divergence? Divergence? Divergence, I knew it was wrong. The Great Divergence, uh, America's Growing Inequality Crisis and What We Can Do About It. And uh, Tim's book is really, I, I think of it as a public service because he takes a complex topic, he dives into the data, uh, he gets to the bottom of very current uh, debates, uh, looks at the trends, and then kind of lines up the usual suspects uh, to see what might explain these trends. And, and some um, uh, factors are more kind of culpable than others, um, but he really prosecutes a, an effective case that I think is very illuminating. And he's then going to tell us, you know, why it matters and what we can do about it. Uh, he does offer a number of prescriptions. Uh, many writers have a uh, last chapter problem. Uh, Tim actually put some real big things on the table that I think match the magnitude of the problem. Um, and uh, I think we're going to look forward to hearing about those. Uh, of course, a lot of his recommendations are going to be very difficult to enact, um, and that's the rub. Often it is. Politics comes into play. Um, it's very difficult to navigate America's unique political landscape, getting over uh, hurdles. And this is where David's book uh, comes in. Uh, David Korn is uh, Washington bureau chief of Mother Jones, uh, also a longtime Washington editor for The Nation. And his book, uh, showdown, the inside story of how Obama fought back against Boehner, Cantor, and the Tea Party, uh, is actually not a study of economic trends, but it's a look at politics. It's a look at real world actors um, navigating changing conditions, unfolding events, special interests, competing interests. And, and it turns out that governing isn't so easy after all. And inside the book, uh, you can kind of learn a lot about how the White House operates in response. It's a very well-reported insider's account that focuses on the story between the midterm elections up until earlier this year. So it's very contemporary. And it covers a lot of the very tax and fiscal policy debates that determine who pays what share, ultimately. And so a lot of the White House and congressional Republican uh, you know, negotiations are ultimately about equity and about inequality. And David's first draft of history, 
uh, I, I suspect it's going to be an enduring draft, um, really captures some of the very interesting details that uh, uh, unfolded during those, uh, those debates. So well told, insightful account, both books worth getting, getting your hands on, very informative. Um, but we're going to hear from them, both of them directly uh, today and uh, get to the bottom of some of these questions around, um, around inequality with politics and policy, with analysis and action. And we're going to see how they all uh, connect. Um, so here's the plan. Tim's going to come up to the podium and present some highlights of his book. He's brought some images for us to look at together. He'll speak for about 15 minutes. Uh, then David will come up and offer his perspective um, on some of the unfolding negotiations with the White House. Um, and then we'll have the reporters sit down and interview each other uh, and include you in the conversation. So um, if you'll help me welcome Tim to the podium, we'll get started. One of the uh, <clears throat> tragic outcomes of my writing this book is that I, in the course of writing it, I learned how to do PowerPoint uh, about 15 years after everybody else, and I, I fell hard for the technology. But I think this is a, uh, a pretty uh, good way to walk briskly through the data in my book. Uh, what you'll be missing is the, uh, the kind of texture in the book, the sort of historical uh, narratives about people like Walter Ruther and Bryce Harlow. Um, but uh, hey, I, I want to give you a reason to buy the book, right? Um, here is the problem, uh, uh, as illustrated by Catherine Mulbrandon, who incidentally is a really brilliant at, uh, at uh, um, depicting economic trends. She has a, a website called visualizingeconomics.com that I recommend to all of you. She does a lot in particular with inequality. Uh, you see uh, the income share for the top 1% is quite large uh, at the end of the 1920s. Um, it then shrinks uh, and, uh, and then starts to grow again in the late 1970s. And here you'll see it a little more vividly. You have uh, really between about 1934 and 1979, a period that's called the Great Compression, where incomes were becoming more equal. Um, and uh, this became uh, uh, to be regarded as a, a natural outcome of uh, mature capitalism. Simon Kuznets, the Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, wrote a very influential paper where he said that after an initial period of disruption created by industrialization, advanced industrial economies tend towards greater income inequality. And it was true for a while, but stopped being true in the late 1970s. And uh, here you see that the income share for the top 1% uh, doubled uh, after 1979. And here you see that the, the trend, the further up you go the income scale, the faster the trend is, is accelerating. Uh, so it's really driven by those at the very top, uh, especially the top 0.1% and the top 0.01%. Recessions are bad for rich people. Um, and during the 2007-2009 recession, the 1% took a bigger hit than the rest of America, as you would expect from uh, people who get a lot of their income from capital gains. Um, this uh, caused a, a few commentators. Uh, I won't mention anybody, but uh, Megan McArdle was one. And uh, she said uh, in the, her Atlantic blog that this meant that possibly the income inequality trend was over. Um, uh, but it was not over. It was, uh, recessions are always hard on the top 1%. Uh, as soon as the recovery began, the, one, the top 1% started increasing its income share again. Uh, as of the end of 2010, it still wasn't uh, back to its uh, pre-2007 level, but it will get there. Um, this is uh, some data that came out too late to be included in my book. It's from Emmanuel Saez, um, who with Thomas Piketty wrote a 2003 paper that kind of invented the vocabulary of the 1% versus the 99%. And the money quote is that 93% of the recovery, as of 2010, 93% of the recovery ended up in the pockets of the top 1%. It was a members-only recovery. 
Uh, inequality is a, uh, an international trend, as you see here. Um, but the United States, uh, it's, it's worse in the United States, and it's getting worse faster in the United States than just about anywhere else. Uh, among industrialized countries, uh, the United States is the undisputed champion when it comes to income share for the top 1%. Uh, important caveat, although this is an international trend, it is not a universal trend among advanced industrial democracies. Uh, Mexico, Turkey, I should probably cross Greece off that list. Uh, Chile and Italy um, actually grew uh, more equal uh, uh, after the mid-1990s. Latin America in general, uh, you know, very, very associated with income inequality, Latin America uh, incomes have been growing more equal in this period. Uh, in my book, I say that France was also growing more equal, but a study that came out after my book went to press showed that uh, inequality was on the rise in France. Even so, if you uh, go back to the mid-1980s, there's little net change in uh, equality trends in France, and the same is true for uh, Hungary and Belgium. Uh, a number of people say, or they don't say it so much anymore, but they, they have said in the past, and some still do, I don't need to care about income inequality because we have so much mobility in the United States. Uh, as has been uh, uh, become a subject of discussion in recent months, actually mobility in the United States lags that of other uh, comparable countries. And here I show it by a statistic that I call income heritability the likelihood that you will uh, occupy an economic position uh, relative to everybody else in society that is the same as your parents. Um, another uh, study that came out after my book went to press, uh, this from um, the uh, uh, Council of Economic Advisors, Alan Kruger, is very interested in income inequality, and he did a chart last winter that showed that um, uh, even if you don't care about income inequality, you sort of have to if you care about mobility because uh, uh, greater income inequality appears to correlate roughly, but it's still, there still seems to be a, a rough correlation between income inequality and uh, what's here called inter intergenerational earnings elasticity, but uh, again, that's what I call um, uh, income heritability. As, as inequality goes up, mobility goes down. Uh, so what's causing this 33-year trend? Um, it's not gender, because the income gap between men and women has actually narrowed. And it's not race, because the income gap between blacks and whites is essentially the same. Um, full stop, the fact that the income gap between uh, blacks and whites is essentially the same is uh, uh, a, uh, a, a truly startling and dismaying uh, uh, fact in itself, if you went into a time machine, went back 33 years and told people that uh, the income gap between blacks and whites would be unchanged a third of a century later, they would have told you you're out of your mind. But um, in any case, the gap hasn't increased, and that means that race can't really be causing this, uh, except indirectly, a couple of people have pointed out to me that, that um, race has affected our politics, and our politics has affected what our government does, uh, and uh, that is certainly true, particularly when you consider the realignment of the, uh, of the white South uh, into the Republican Party. Changes in federal taxes and benefits have play some role, but not as much as you would think. Um, the uh, effective tax rate, uh, all federal taxes, uh, for the top 1% is lower than it was in 79, but not hugely lower, which is remarkable given that um, the uh, you know, top marginal rate today is at 30, 35% is half what it was when Ronald Reagan took office. Um, Strangely, the, the income tax is actually slightly more progressive today than it was in 1979, and that's because in spite of the drop of the top marginal rates, uh, we've taken so many people uh, off the income tax rolls at the bottom. Uh, this was a conservative idea invented by Russell Long, Senator Russell Long, and um, championed by Ronald Reagan, and then 
Bill Clinton, and uh, like a lot of old conservative ideas, it's a conservative idea that today's conservatives want to abandon. They want to raise taxes on the poor in order to make it more possible to uh, lower taxes on the rich, uh, which is fairly mind-boggling. Um, immigration uh, has had a limited effect. Uh, m most of the uh, immigrants uh, have only uh, lack a high school degree. And uh, so they, the, 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 the principal native-born population that's affected are high school dropouts in the United States. And they have uh, seen their incomes reduced by 7.4% because of immigration. Uh, that's a little less than 0.4% per year. Um, uh, for everybody else, uh, immigration really has had no uh, significant uh, effect. And, um, uh, you know, interestingly, I just did a TRB column a few weeks ago about this new Pew uh, uh, study, which found that um, uh, Mexican immigration in the United States is way, way down, uh, partly because of uh, economic development in Mexico, partly because of demographic changes in Mexico. Some people think it'll go up again once the recovery is in full swing in the United States, but the downward trend is actually about a decade old, so it predates the recession. Uh, so we may actually... Uh, in, in classic uh, American style, we may be arguing about something right now in the political realm that uh, in, in the real world is already evaporating. Uh, trade had a limited uh, but growing effect. Uh, it really didn't start to have a significant effect until the late 1990s. Uh, and the reason was that until then, most of uh, the U.S. trading partners had incomes that were comparable to uh, those roughly comparable to those of the United States. That changed uh, with the rise of uh, uh, trade with China, uh, China and Mexico, especially China, of course, um, which is paradoxically manages to be a rich country and a poor country at the same time uh, with um, uh, you know, a billion workers whose uh, wages are not, they're gonna come up, but it's gonna take a while because there are so many of them. Uh, this is Rachel Maddow's favorite chart in the entire world, um, and it's, uh, it illustrates uh, a point made by Larry Bartels in his book, Unequal Democracy, and it shows that um, if you want to do something about income inequality, a good start would be to vote for Democrats for president, because going back to 1948, you see opposite trends. Under Democratic presidents, the uh, largest income gains have been at the bottom and have tapered off as you go up the income scale. Uh, under Republicans, the precise opposite. The biggest income gains have gone to those at the top and tapered off as you go down the income scale. Um, you'll also observe there has been more economic growth under the Democrats than the Republicans. Again, this is going back to 48. Um, the important caveat is that, uh, that uh, when you get above the 95th percentile, these partisan differences start to evaporate. Uh, rich people do extremely well no matter what the party, uh, no matter what party the president belongs to. Uh, the decline of labor is um, a hugely important factor. Um, so big and obvious that it scarcely needs to be dis discussed at length. Uh, Union density peaked in 1954 at about 40% of the private sector workforce. Today it's down to about 7%, which is what it was uh, before the New Deal. And a sentence I found myself tempted to write multiple times as I was writing this book was, it's as if the New Deal never happened. Um, the, uh, the shortage of skilled labor relative to the demand for skilled labor uh, contributes to income inequality. Uh, the high school graduation rate rose and rose and rose through the 20th century as technological demands on workers also rose and rose and rose. Uh, in the 1970s, though, it dipped and then leveled off. And so when the most recent technological revolution, the computer revolution, came along, uh, the supply of uh, skilled laborers relative to uh, uh, demand uh, suddenly was short. And you see that here as a supply and demand curve. Uh, now, so far I've talked uh, uh, entirely about one kind of income inequality, which is the skills-based uh, kind of income inequality. Uh, when we talk about the income inequality trend of the last 33 years, we're really talking about 
two trends, um, mostly unrelated. One is the divide between skilled labor and unskilled labor. Um, and that's complicated and has many factors, and that's why most of my book discusses that. But we also have um, the 1% versus the 99%, uh, also hugely significant, probably in the last decade more significant uh, than the other. Um, there, you hear some debate uh, sometimes uh, among liberals about which uh, is more important. Um, I think if you're looking back over 33 years, it's indisputable that both are very important. Um, the reason uh, I don't discuss the 1% uh, problem at great length is because the causes are very simple. Um, there are two causes. One is runaway CEO uh, pay and pay for top executives generally, which Nell is a great expert on. And, um, and the other is the financialization of the economy, deregulation of Wall Street, conversion of uh, uh, investment uh, bank partnerships into corporations. Um, and this chart kind of shows you, uh, this, this chart shows you the, uh, uh, who are the top 0.1% in the distribution of income. In 79, 48% uh, were, were executives and managers at non-financial corporations. They've dropped a little bit down to 43%. Uh, the second biggest chunk is um, uh, uh, the financial professions. They were 11% in 79, now they have jumped to 18%. And my guess is they, that's 2005, my guess is they have just continued to grow ever since. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, you hear a lot about how, you know, sort of artists and sports figures and entertainers contribute to this. They don't contribute very much. There just aren't a, a enough of them. So uh, they were, what, 2.2 percent in 79. Now they're up to uh, 3 percent, uh, you know, not a hugely significant uh, portion. Uh, Emmanuel Saez, in the paper he wrote that I cited earlier in March, concluded, such an uneven recovery can help explain the recent public demonstrations against inequality, which I just think is a model of academic understatement. Um, so that is uh, the great divergence, and in question and answers uh, later, I'd be happy to talk about some of the solutions I discuss in my book. Uh, let me give my thanks to the New America Fouda Foundation, which has become sort of a fountain of ideas in Washington, D.C., and thank Reed for inviting us. I thank Tim Noah for making inequality sexy, well, almost. Um, we at Mother Jones, um, I think before Tim's series, but kind of in the same vicinity, put out a bunch of charts on inequality, and I have some handouts, and uh, we, we can share them, but you can also find them on our website. They became kind of a viral sensation, and we literally got millions of hits on them as the Occupy movement was arising, which really, quite honestly, surprised all of us. But it showed that there was a, a, a great demand for information, particularly, I think, and this is what, what Tim does so well, for information that takes us out of the cut and dry academic context and puts us in, in, in either a historical context or a current context that people can relate to as they're trying to make sense of what they see going on around them in their own lives. Now, I hadn't realized this um, until Reed pointed it out to me, but that I had written a book about income inequality um, and that a lot of what you know, happened in, in the context of my book was about economic fairness. You know, my book is a behind-the-scenes narrative of what happened in the White House and the Oval Office after the disastrous for Democrats election in 2010, through the lame duck session and the budget fight and the and the and the debt ceiling uh, uh, debacle, and through the beginning of this year, and again and again and again, a lot of these a lot of these issues uh, turned on some of the fundamental notions. Uh, that we're discussing here today. And I was really intrigued with explaining and, and describing and chronicling the intersection of politics and policy, 
governing and campaigning. And it came about from conversations that I had with people at the White House, particularly about the, um, in the lame duck session, about what the president should or shouldn't do about extending the Bush tax cuts. Uh, you remember that was sort of the big fight that happened, the first big fight that happened after the 2010 elections. Now, back in 2008, I'll drop back a second here, especially prior to the collapse of the market in September uh, 2008, uh, Obama, as a candidate, as a senator, r routinely talked about the erosion of the American dream. By that, he meant a decline in middle class incomes and a decline in what was perceived to be uh, general economic security for people who were not in the top one or five or 10 percent. And he noted it was one of the reasons he was seeking the office of president. He wanted to do something about this. And that was even before Tim's Slate series. Um, but once he got into office, he had to first worry about putting out the fire and preventing the collapse of modern American capitalism and, 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 high, and high finance. And I think his efforts probably had a, had, a, had a positive impact on income inequality, if only to prevent it from becoming worse. Imagine if there had been no stimulus. You know, according to the CBO, the stimulus saved or, or, or created 3.6 million jobs. Not, as enough, not enough that was, as was needed, but more than zero. Um, imagine if there had been no auto bailout. And, um, but as, as we saw, and as Tim sort of got to with, his, with his, some of his charts, the top 1% was still able to recover quicker and better after the financial crisis in terms of the market going up and wealth rising again than the ability of American w workers had to recover in terms of finding jobs or getting you know, higher incomes. The market came roaring back, but jobs and income did not. And so uh, that's something I think the president has struggled with in terms you know, post-stimulus and particularly after the 2010 election when he was now sort of on the, um, on the run politically. And the first big engagement that happened was that fight over the tax cut deal. You know, the issue seemed to be to most Americans who were paying attention, which may not be most Americans, that um, whether or not the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy would be extended, because they ran out at the end of 2010. Republicans in Congress were saying, well, we won't allow these, to, we, we demanded that they be extended, Otherwise, they would not vote for the extension of the tax cuts as they applied to the middle class. So there was sort of a game of high-stakes chicken. You know, some Democrats, in, liberal Democrats, progressive Democrats, were egging the president on to have a standoff with the Republicans over this and show the whole world the, what a surprise. The Republicans seem to favor tax cuts for the rich more than anything else. Uh, the president was faced... I think with a, with, a, with, a, with a tough dilemma. He, of course, was on record, had campaigned against you know, these tax cuts for the rich, you know, partic particularly on the notion of economic fairness. Uh, and, that was even be and that was before the crash occurred. But now he and his political advisors, particularly Joe Biden, believed that they couldn't win this fight largely because some Democrats in the Senate wouldn't stand by them out of fear of being accused of being in favor of tax hikes even though this was just a return to old tax rates. And the president also wanted to do something to address the economic situation at hand. Basically, he wanted a second stimulus. But because he had lost the messaging war in the first stimulus, there was no way it was going to pass by a Senate filibuster or even maybe you know, get enough Democratic votes in the, in, in the House to pass. So he very slyly, and I think, you know, outside the, 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 the observations of many pundits, you know, came up with a plan that would have all these income-boosting policies in, the, in a package in terms of the payroll tax cut, which helped middle and low-income Americans more, you know, disproportionately as opposed to those on the high end. Um, unemployment benefits, which were running out, with the, which, which um, Republicans wouldn't renew and plenty of tax credits for working and middle-income Americans that were part of the original stimulus, but they were expiring. And again, these are all things that the House and Senate Democrats were not able to get through on their own. So the president came up with what might be called a bit of a devil's bargain. He would sacrifice his position 
on tax cuts for the wealthy in order to get all these great policy gains. And in terms of pure numbers, uh, it was like $240 billion in second stimulus to, I don't know, 20, uh, 20 to 80 billion dollars in new benefits, including uh, state tax cuts for the wealthy. So this was his way to sort of address some of these economic fairness issues in a manner that he could not otherwise do. And in the, in the way that it was covered in the media, and I you know, count myself as part of this, it looked more or less as if he had lost. That the tax cuts for the wealthy were going through despite his you know, uh, un unequivocal promise to get rid of them. And it was uh, a matter of, in my, in my case, when you do a book and you go back and you look at things you know, over time and after the dust has settled, you get to have a little bit of a different evaluation since sometimes uh, when you're involved in the cable debate of the nanosecond. And I think ultimately that was his attempt. And he kind of realized he was about to head into the, the desert in terms of the House Republicans coming in and there'd be no chance to legislate anything, let alone tax benefits for working Americans or the, or the working poor. It was like the gas stop, last gas for 250 miles. So he had to tank up. The price was yielding on the Bush tax breaks. But it was a way, of, I think, of setting up what would come across in the next year and a half. Uh, through the budget fight at the beginning of last year and the deficit fight that went through last summer that was very ugly, Obama kept trying to use these confrontations with Republicans to advance some of these larger messaging points about economic inequality, about fairness. Uh, he really started doing this reframing uh, almost two years, uh, almost a year ago, when he gave the speech attacking the Ryan budget after it was first released. Remember, you know, it, it, it got rid of the Medicare, it got rid of the Medicare guarantee, had draconian cuts, and also a trillion dollars or so in tax breaks for the wealthy, above and beyond the Bush tax breaks, which it also would continue. And um, the president, you know, after sort of laying low on, on some of this fight for the first few months of the year, gave this speech down, the, down a few blocks away at George Washington University when he claimed that the GOP proposal would lead to a fundamentally different America than the one we've known. And he cited all the statistics, 25% cut in education, cuts in health care, you know, revamping Medicare and Medicaid in ways that would really either put the burden on seniors or make it harder for the poor to find health care. And he said, these are the kinds of cuts that tell us we can't afford the America that I believe in and I think you believe in. And he went even further. He said, I believe the Ryan budget plan paints a vision of our future that is deeply pessimistic. Now, that was really, I think, quite a, not a breakthrough moment, but in politics when we talk about budgeting, we usually don't talk about it in these larger, more noble terms, optimistic, pessimistic. But the president was saying that... Um, that the Republican view was one that would sort of guarantee that we couldn't do anything about economic mobility. If poor or, or, or children from stressed out economic families were not able to go to college, well, sorry, you're out of luck. If we, you know, if we were talking about revitalizing our infrastructure as a way to create jobs and lift some income, well, we're out of luck in that as well. And he said, you know, this, is, I think, is sort of dovetails a little bit with the notion of economic, how we think about economic inequality. He says, this vision is less about changing the basic social compact in America. Um, it's, um, I don't think there's anything courageous about asking for sacrifice from those who can least afford it and don't have any clout on Capitol Hill. And I think the, when we talk about economic inequality, we do it in sort of wonky terms, but when you sort of boil it down, it's really about a social compact. Do we as a nation sort of come together communally to try to address this and, try and, and, and think of economic equality as a social good that is best for, our, for us over the long run and over the sort of the wide landscape of our, of our society. And so Obama, without using the term e equality, inequality, was really talking about economic fairness. And in the weeks ahead, as he shifted towards the deficit ceiling fight, Again, about as wonky a subject as we've ever had, 
you know, dominate the headlines, he kept trying to sort of tether this debate to these larger notions. Remember talk, him talking about shared sacrifice? If we're going to do this, there has to be shared sacrifice. And he kept talking about the need to preserve investments in education and job-creating initiatives, such as research and de development. I mentioned infrastructure. And he kept talking about this is what we need to protect and preserve the middle class. Um, he talked about how middle class incomes had been stagnant since 79. And it was his way of addressing the inequality issue without sounding like, and I think it was kind of, uh, uh, it was ingenious to do this, without sounding like this is a charity case. You know, this is, you know, the, and, he, and, he, and he continued to develop this theme uh, up until even today. I mean, at the, and at the end of the deficit crisis, at the, the Republicans and the president both saw their numbers, approval ratings, just hit, you know, rock bottom. And Congress got, I think, to 13% approval ratings. I mean, I was asking pollsters, could you get to the negatives? They were going so low. Obama still was in the low 40s. He did better. But his messaging... If you started asking people, do you think this idea of investment and shared sacrifice is better than the idea of cutting government and cutting taxes and sort of hunkering down? And again and again, the polls were showing that, the, that, that most Americans favored the former, not the latter. So he seemed to have scored some advances. And then he went on to propose a jobs bill and, that was a center point for more confrontation on some of these greater issues. And... Um, with the rise of the Occupy movement in the, in the fall, Obama, I think very, it was very interestingly, decided to reprise a speech he had given in 2007 to a bunch of Wall Street executives at NASDAQ up in New York City. Back then, he had told the corporate guys, maybe there were a few gals there, that corporate excesses, such as extravagant CEO compensation and the subprime mor mortgage fiasco would undermine American capitalism. And he, can, and he suggested that Wall Street shenanigans would sort of cut Wall Street off from Main Street and do damage to both. And again, he was talking about the idea of, of economic opportunity being connected to the notion of economic fairness. And he said to them, he kind of warned them, you know, in an impressive way, that they had to be mindful not to become, not to, not to cut the connection between Wall Street and Main Street. Now, not many of them, I think, listened at that point in time, but in the fall of 2011, he wanted to inject that thinking back into the political debate. And a CBO study that had come out in that fall on income inequality had, had caught his eye. That study had said that the wealthiest 1% had tripled their income since 79, and the middle class had seen a 1% rise each year, so a tremendous gap. So to give this speech, he chose Osawatomie, Kansas. Um, at the time, the White House tweeted out a tweet, can anyone tell us why? And most of the, answer was, most of the answers were something like, it's right in the middle of the country, geographically speaking. That wasn't the right answer. The right answer was that in 1912, Teddy Roosevelt had given what is probably the most radical speech ever delivered by a president or ex-president, as he was at the time, in Asadawanami, Kansas. It was called the, um, uh, the, the New Nationalism Speech. And he was responding to the rise of industrialization and the growing power of wealth and the tycoons. Uh, and at the time, he said the citizens of the United States had to effectively control the mighty commercial forces, and he called for a square deal in which, uh, which, would inquire, which would entail rigorous government regulation of the workplace and big finance. Obama's speech was not as radical, <laughs> no surprise, but he talked about the raging debate over the best ways to, to restore growth and prosperity, restore balance, and here, his term for e inequality, restore fairness that this was a make or break moment for the middle class and for those fighting to get into the middle class. Again, talking about social mobility. And he noted that the, that, United State, that the United States had become a nation of greater inequality, claiming that a child born into poverty now had less of a chance of reaching the middle class than, the same, than a child in such circumstances 50 years ago. This isn't about class warfare, he said. This is about the nation's welfare. And he was setting up a theme that I think he saw as being a center point, or one of the touchstones of the coming campaign in 2012. And 
it carried through it's carried through to the spring when at the beginning of, of April he gave a speech and it was kind of the first speech he gave of the campaign lashing into Romney. It was a quasi lash. He was working into working up to it. But it was a speech to newspaper editors who had assembled here in town and he was again attacking the the latest version of the Ryan budget. And he called it thinly veiled social Darwinism. It's an antithetical to our entire history as a land of opportunity and upward mobility for, uh, for everybody who's willing to work for it. Um, so once again, he was tying his agenda of tax fairness, of investments. You know, one reason we can't give tax breaks to the rich, he argues again and again, is that we need to invest in education, R&D, and other things in order to build and protect the middle class so that there is greater mobility and there is income security or economic security over the long run. So that's how he sort of gets at this issue. And, you know, he's now, he started noting that actually Romney is tied to the forces who would say, we don't have to do that. We'll just let the market do what the, you know, you know do this on its own. And we can see from Tim's chart, if you look at the, you know, the great divergence, market forces have worked on income in the last uh, three decades, and it hasn't been a pretty picture or a pretty chart. Um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a more recent speech, in the beginning of May, the speech he gave, Obama gave, in, um, that was dead the official launch of the campaign uh, down at Virginia Commonwealth, and he gave the same speech in Ohio that, 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 uh, the same day, you know, he tried to sort of combine both sides of the American experience you know, rugged individualism, you know, letting markets work, and the communal nature we have of tending for, uh, for one another, you know, whether, you know, thinking of, like, you know, the best of private equity, we might say, and a barn raising in an in, in Amish country. And he said, we believe the free market is one of the greatest forces for progress in human history, that businesses are the engine of growth, and that risk takers and innovators should be rewarded. But we also believe that at its best, the free market has never been a license to take whatever you want, however you can get it. We understood that alongside our entrepreneurial spirit, our rugged individualism, America only prospers when we meet our obligations to one another and future generations. And he noted that, a, uh, a sh that up to 2008, a shrinking number of Americans did fantastically well while most people struggled with falling incomes and rising costs, and the slowest job growth in half a century. So he seems to really be absorbing, you know, the message that Tim has been putting forward, and thank you, Tim, and, you know, reading the charts, but reacting to the same issues, but trying to put them in a political context that connects and that will work. And that brings us to the last couple of weeks and his attack on Mitt Romney and Bain. You know, it was, you know, it was like this is the wrong way to go about, you know, creating jobs. In some instances you may, you might, some instances you may not, but the priority with Bain is about maximizing profits. And you might remember you know, a Sunday two back, Cory Booker, supposedly as a surrogate for the Obama campaign, went on and kind of dismissed the Bain ads. Now, Corey gets a lot, of, I like Corey a lot. He's a, he's very motiv a, a great motivational speaker and he's done some very courageous things. But um, he also gets a lot of money from private equity people based in New York. And he clearly didn't like this attack. And within other parts of the Democratic big tent, there was some grumbling about uh, Obama going after business. And of course, the Republicans made it sound like he hated all free enterprise and that this, you know, that the, and, and that if you attacked Bain or raised questions about Bain, you, you were nothing other than a communist. Um, but I thought in response to Cory Booker's remarks, he was asked a question at a press conference about this. And I thought he really handled this tremendously well and gave a better response than anyone from the campaign or any of the talking heads that had been chewing on this over the past few days, which shows you one reason why he's president. And he said, when you're president, as opposed to the head of a private equity firm, as in you know who, then your job is not simply to maximize profits. Your job is to figure out how everybody in the country has a fair shot.
Your job is to think about those workers who got laid off and how we are paying for their retraining. Your job is to think about how, the, how those communities can start creating new clusters so they can attract new businesses. Your job as president is to think about how do we set up equitable tax systems so that everybody is paying their fair share that allows us to then invest in science and technology and infrastructure, all of which are going to help us grow. My main, you know, I'll skip ahead. My job is to take into account everybody, not just some. My job is to make sure that the country is growing, not just now, but 10 years from now and 20 years from now. Now, a cynical political observer would say, when the economy stinks, it's great for you to say, don't judge me on the economy now, judge me on what I can do for you 10 years down the road. But at the same time, I think he's, uh, Obama, in the last three years and as a candidate, has been trying to figure out how to address the, you know, these very hard to wrestle with political and policy questions about income and economic fairness in the country. And I do think it will be at the center, whether the issue is Bain or something else, but we at the center of the debate we have in the next five months. And if, um, and if Tim wants anything that in his last chapter to happen anywhere in the next four to eight years, he better hope, as he says, that a Democrat gets elected, if not in, just in the White House, but in, but in the um, House and Senate as well, because I do believe there's a profound philosophical difference here. And if you ask Mitt Romney in a moment of candor what he would like to see, he'd like to see creative destruction. He believes in it. But um, we see some of the uh, ramifications and manifestations of that in Tim's chart. And um, this is the debate that will be joined, and hopefully it will, it will, have, it will count as much as in a debate over what surrogates say or who ate dog meat or not uh, in the coming months. So thanks for listening. Okay, thank you, Tim and David. And actually, last time we had David here, he was um, interviewing Elizabeth Warren uh, when we were debating what to do with financial reform. And he, he made news that day by, by asking her for the first time publicly whether she would consider running for, for public office. And I think she said, um, I'd rather gouge out my eyes. <laughs> and David, being the, the, the news savvy reporter, went back and wrote it up as, she didn't say no. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> <laughs> and you were right. Um, so, uh, David, should we make some news today? What can we ask Tim? Uh, Are you running to? for the Senate? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, you know, uh, I, 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 let me ask you about a poll that just that literally came out today that Chris Silliz was writing about in the Washington Post. I saw it as I, as I came in here. Um, because, uh, you know, uh, as you could tell from my, my comments, you know, my concern or my area of interest is how to talk about this stuff in a way leads to, you know, the, the opportunity to do the policy that, that you'd like to see happen. And um, this poll was done by Jeff Guerin, who is a Democratic poster, who I like a lot, often gives Democrats bad news, so they can tell he's honest. Uh, but he was, he was polling independent voters, and he said, um, which party is better positioned uh, to improve the economy, has better positions for improving the economy? And of independents, you know, right now, 40% said the Republicans, and 37% said Democrats. Not good news. And so he then said, okay, here are two perspectives. The Republicans want to cut spending and lower taxes to get the economy going. The Democrats say we need to invest in education, and infrastructure, and science. What do you say? 46% went with the, with the Republican view, and 44% went with the Democrats. Again, not good news for the Democrats. But then he asked the question this way. Who do you trust to look out for the middle class? And 49% said of the independents said the Democrats, and only 33% said the Republicans. So a real big, the others were kind of close. Big difference here in your terminology. So as you talk about income inequality, you know, are there ways to talk about it in terms of protecting, building, enhancing, bolstering, boosting? you know, the much cherished middle class. Right. Um, yes, and that's mostly what uh, 
President Obama is doing. Um, as you were discussing those poll results, I was thinking um, it's, uh, as a Democrat, I find it really delightful that um, the Republicans seem to be finding that every time they try to attack Obama, it doesn't really work because people like Obama. Yeah. And simultaneously, the Democrats are discovering that every time they attack Romney, it kind of works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So there's kind of asymmetrical warfare going on uh, that for, for once actually benefits Democrats. Um, the, uh, yes, the middle class is an important part of the story. Uh, there is all sorts of uh, debate that goes on, academic debate and also political debate, about the extent to which the middle class is endangered. And, uh, but when you sort of scrape away all of the... Um, uh, vanity uh, of all the people involved in the ideology. What you find is that there are some people who think that the middle class has shrunk a lot, and then there are other people who think the middle class has shrunk some. So th there <laughs> seems to be broad agreements that the middle class has shrunk, and that is uh, problematic. Now, part of the story is that um, a number of people who were middle class have moved up and become more affluent, and a lot of conservatives think that's an argument stopper. Um, but the fact is we still need a middle class. Uh, Barrington Moore, famous Harvard sociologist, said it very pithily, no bourgeois, no democracy. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, this was based on you know, looking at societies all, all over the world, different mm -hmm. historical periods. Uh, and um, I don't think the president can put it quite that way, but the middle class is in fact uh, uh, a, uh, a, a central building block of democracy. It's hard to sustain democracy without a middle class. And, and Tim, actually, the, the debates around mobility and, and the data are uh, a little old at this point. We're not actually able to get a hold of some of the more recent data that uh, reflects the impact of the recession. And I think that uh, argument will be a little harder to make now because of middle class families that had a lot of their wealth in housing uh, have really taken a big hit, and there's a lot of kind of debt overhang for many families uh, now. Meanwhile, securities and stocks at the very top have rebounded, and I think this is going to be one of the key drivers of inequality going forward. And it's one thing that you didn't really focus on in your book, the extent of wealth holdings and wealth inequality, and I wanted to ask you why. Right, right. Uh, always with the wealth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I took the position in my book, first of all, my book is really I think of my book as principally a history of what happened in the last 30 years. Uh, and to tell that history, you also have to go back and look at the pattern for the past 100 years. Um, and that, so it's kind of a history with a, a final chapter that proposes some solutions. And uh, historically, uh, what Americans started thinking, Americans really never thought about, uh, when they thought about um, uh, distribution issues, fairness issues. Uh, they thought about the distribution of wealth uh, for uh, a very long time, as late as uh, whenever it was, uh, early 20th century when uh, Teddy Roosevelt gave his famous speech about the mal He didn't talk about the malfactors of great income. He talked about the malfactors of great wealth. Um, the first really substantial uh, uh, study of distribution of income in the United States was produced by a guy named Wilfred King in 1915. Uh, he was a, a progressive. He, he later became a kind of a right winger, but he, was, he studied at the University of Wisconsin under the famous progressive economist Richard Ely. And he laid it out. And so the question becomes, why did, why did why did we have to wait until the progressive era before people started looking at incomes? And the reason was that um, we had, uh, for a long time, an agriculture-based economy. And when you're talking about an agrarian society, what matters is wealth, what you need your piece of land uh, in order to uh, produce food that you may live on and bring the extra to market to sell. Um, wealth really was what mattered. But as we became an industrial economy, uh, uh, King believed, the progressives believed, and I believe, that, that income mattered more. Um, uh, you uh, didn't want to give workers, workers weren't going to grow their own food, uh, they were going to buy their own food, in, urban workers in the city, industrial workers, uh, and so they needed income. And so what really mattered in people's lives 
was income. It took, it took the sort of left of center a while to accommodate itself to the idea that you know, the, the agrarian ideal was a thing of the past and that we were going to be an industrialized nation. Um, I think that's still basically what we are. When I look at wealth, uh, I, I, I think there are some interesting patterns, but, but basically there are so few people in America who really possess wealth. That, um, and it's so difficult to figure out ways to redistribute wealth that um, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's kind of too difficult to grapple with. I mean, statistically speaking, the you know, percentage of households that actually possess uh, any meaningful kind of wealth is, is tiny. Um, and uh, uh, you did have a lot of wealth that was lost in 2008 in the form of um, you know, collapsing housing prices and so on. But if you're talking about the subprime market, a lot of that was make-believe wealth to begin with. Um, I think the real tragedy for people who lost their homes was that they lost their homes and not that they lost some uh, theoretical uh, amount of wealth. Um, that, uh, so that's my kind of long answer uh, to why I focus on income. Uh, but in the book, I, I'm also just mostly just following the lead of 20th century economists who really were more interested in income than wealth. Um. All right, well, let's get to your last chapter. Uh, you, you do have some um, pretty big proposals in there. Maybe you could talk about some of the major ones, and then David could give an assessment of whether they're uh, feasible or not. <laughs> right. Uh, number one, uh, soak the rich. Soak the rich, yes. Um, even though, uh, even though uh, the income tax is not a major cause of income inequality, uh, it can certainly be used to ameliorate income inequality. Uh, and also, we're going to have to raise taxes a lot in this country. We're going to have to raise taxes on the middle class. Um, uh, uh, the president won't tell you that, but that's definitely going to be part of the future. And uh, if that's going to happen, it's going to be especially important to demonstrate that, as, as David said, the, the rich are paying their fair share. So I think that not only do you need to raise, uh, uh, restore the Clinton era top marginal uh, tax rate for incomes over 250000 but you need to lay in uh, uh, additional brackets over uh, 1 million and uh, 10 million. Now, Nancy Pelosi last week uh, horrified a lot of people by saying that she wants to, um, uh, uh, she's willing to cut a deal uh, making the threshold $1 million. And a lot of people said, God, that is a terrible policy uh, to uh, let people whose incomes are between 250,000 and uh, 1 million off the hook. Um, I agree that from a policy point of view it was a terrible idea, but politically, I, I'd be curious to see if you agree with me. I thought it was pretty smart because... Well, you know, Chuck Schumer tried to make that case last year, when, uh, or 2010, when they were having this fight over the Bush tax cuts. And um, a, you know, Larry Summers and a lot of the policy people in the White House didn't like it because you actually capture a lot of revenue between two and 50,000 and one million. Right. And so, you know, to give, let those people off the hook, I mean, Schumer was doing it for political reasons, but if you, you know, if you're trying to put together a policy, uh, 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 you know, a set of policies that make sense, you know, that, you know, you end up with the price of a tax hike, being accused of raising taxes without bringing enough in uh, to sort of, you know, you, 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 you only fill the, you don't fill the hole enough right, but for the, the beauty, same pain. But the beauty is, it, it's, a, it's an offer you only extend when you know the other side is not going to accept yes, it. Yes, so you yes. run on it. Yeah, you can run on it, but it also sets, you know, and Geithner was worried about this too, it, it, sort of, it, it, it sort of sets a new bar at what sort of taxation is acceptable. Right, so after you know. the election, what Nancy Pelosi says was, $1 million, that was my pre-election rate. <laughs> yeah, now now it drops back to 250000 and when people say, oh, you were bargaining yeah. in bad faith, uh, she can just say, well, you what know, do you the, think the Republicans do? You know, the interesting thing is, um, the, you know, the, the whole issue of taxation, which we could do a couple of hours on here, in terms of politics and policy, uh, is so vexing for the Democrats. Uh, there's a quote in my book in which they're, you know, after the, I think it's after the 2010 election or right about that, where they're talking about what to do, whether they have a tax cut fight um, over the Bush high-end uh, tax cuts in the White House. And, and Biden, you know, says, you can, you can hear him saying this, there's one thing I know, 
It's that the Democrats in the Senate never hang tough on a tough tax vote. And <laughs> they, uh, you know, the, the idea of being accused of raising taxes, even if all you're doing is restoring rates that were from an economic boom time of the 90s, or raising rates on people making over 250,000, over a million, you know, still spooks so many Democrats because they fear being called tax hikers. And what's made the fear even more intense than it ever was, was um, is Citizens United. The fact now that any super PAC could come in at a moment's notice and spend $100,000, $500,000 on you and call you, you know, a tax hiker. You, you don't even know who's behind it. So you can't even, it's not like the other candidates doing it and you can accuse them of lying or being disingenuous. So that's really made it harder for, you know, for some Democrats. You know, when they were having this discussion in the White House um, and in the, the Capitol about whether to have a, a pre-election vote on the Bush tax cuts for the rich um, in the summer of 2010, Harry Reid was for doing this. Nancy Pelosi was for doing this. I think Obama would have gone along if he thought they could win it and the rest of the party was with him. But, you know, but Barbara Boxer, that great liberal uh, you know, from Democrat from California who was up for re-election, came to Harry Reid and said, don't make me have this vote. Now, of course, she would, you know, is against these tax breaks, but when you have people, and, you know, and I don't mean this to you know, make she her sound... She was ready sound, to hang tough? You know, I, don't, I don't mean to make her sound more craven than any other Democratic senator, but when you have a situation like that, it's very difficult, and I think you know, a lot of the outside critics who are saying, you know, accusing Obama of selling out on the Bush tax cuts you know, didn't full, have a full understanding of the political dynamics on the Democratic side. So while, you know, so, so whether you make it a million or whatever, you know, I just see the uh, raising taxes in the, in the near future on, on any of these brackets, you know, it, it seems such a heavy lift, more so than, than when Clinton did it, you know, with that budget in 1993. Mm -hmm. Another of Tim's recommendations is about fattening government payroll. And uh, Tim, I, you can talk about that if you'd like, but, but David, I also wanted to know from you, uh, whether this was ever part of kind of internal White House uh, deliberations. You know, one of the, you look at the, 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 the employment numbers, um, and it's very dramatic what's happening at state and local government levels, where uh, we're, we're increasing jobs in the private sector, we're losing them in the yeah. public sector at the very time when we, um, you know, uh, should be addressing the job problem. You know, is that part of the calculations internally? And, 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 well, and yeah, well, Tim, well, you know, uh, in Tim's last chapter, he talks about you know, in increasing, you know, uh, uh, the government payroll and that, you know, putting, you know, hiring people directly is the most direct form of using tax dollars to create employment. I mean, it kind of seems pretty darn obvious. Uh, but I spoke to several of the economic policy people in the Obama administration, you know, particularly the time period after the first stimulus when they were trying, when the policy people wanted more stimulus in 2009 and 2010 when they thought that the economy was really getting much weaker and the stimulus wasn't doing enough. And they kept, you know, they're saying, you know, it's really hard to come up with job creating ideas if you're not creating jobs yourself. You know, giving money to states, you know, trying to create different programs that will, you know, or different investments that will eventually lead to jobs. The whole notion of shovel ready projects, which has become a joke for conservatives. Um, that's all kind of harder because it's all more indirect, and so the you know the, so the I, but the I, but but they were working within a political constraint, which you know which I won't take issue with, that just sort of you know creating you know a public works administration again and deciding to build a Hoover Dam, uh, or you know or hiring people you know directly to 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 do other infrastructural projects or other things. Um, it, seems to be, again, really hard within our political climate. Well, it, it's funny. I, I, from a historical point of view, it's, it's amusing because uh, in 1933, mm. you know, FDR was concerned about, uh, you know, unemployment was 25%. And he was concerned that families were going to starve in the winter. And uh, he got Harry Hopkins to start uh, what was the forerunner of the, uh, of the WPA. 
And uh, you know, the Obama administration talks about how they've created over three years, not quite four million jobs. Harry Hopkins created four million jobs within a period of three months. Um, and you know, four million jobs uh, back in 1933 was, was, a, further. <laughs> was a huge, much bigger portion of our overall economy. Um, uh, so you know, I, I wrote a piece about this with, with Charlie Peters for Slate uh, around the time uh, the stimulus was being discussed. Uh, so it, it has been done in the past. I, you know, there are sort of new difficulties, environmental impact statements, and all sorts of things that didn't exist back in 1933. Those are but, jobs. Right, the, uh, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Those are federal jobs. <laughs> uh, let, let's open it up to questions from the floor. If you'd like to ask uh, Tim or David um, about their book, uh, we'll have a mic going around. And let's start right here on the aisle. Hannah will deliver the mic. Other hands, let me see who would like to get into the conversation. Yes. Uh, I'm just uh, a bit confused on the causes and the cure. Uh, you mentioned the, the, among the causes of, of the uh, income inequality would be weak unions and the skilled labor shortage. Uh, the, the cure, part of the cure would be to raise uh, income taxes on the middle class, which from an economic point of view, it's hard to explain, but it makes sense. Uh, but still, isn't, wouldn't that be seen politically as contradictory uh, if, the, if part of the problem is growing income in, in inequality and a weaker middle class? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it is contradictory. And I, I, um, uh, when I said the taxes are going to have to be raised on the middle class, I didn't mean in order to address the problem of income inequality. I meant in order to address the problem of the deficit. Uh, um, so I think that reality is something that we're going to have to steer around as we as we talk about solutions to income inequality. But but absolutely, it, it from a uh, income distribution perspective, it doesn't help to start a tax on the middle class. But it does help ameliorate it if you jack up taxes significantly higher for those at higher incomes. Okay, in the back here. One of the uh, less covered aspects of inequality is the fact that you have a small number of rich people using up a lot of human and natural resources and products that don't necessarily improve human welfare. I know one study shows that after 75,000, you know, the, your consumption doesn't really improve uh, your happiness. I was wondering if you've encountered any uh, other studies of the waste of inequality and how you think that uh, these studies could be used in a political argument. Um. I did see some. Of, I did look at some of these happiness studies. Um, they're usually wielded by conservatives to sort of argue that that uh, you know there may be a lot of in, income inequality, but there isn't commensurate uh, unhappiness. Studies do seem to show that above, really above the level of subsistence, uh, money does not buy happiness. It can buy you out of mi misery if you're poor, uh, but it won't affirmatively buy you uh, happiness. The moon belongs to everyone, and so forth. Um, uh, the, the, um, and, and it's also sometimes argued, you know, Joe has a refrigerator that costs uh, $200, Sam has a refrigerator that costs $2,000, uh, but really what is, Sam isn't getting anything extra for his $2,000 refrigerator. Uh, you know, yeah, I guess, but he wants the two, he must have some reason for wanting that $2,000 refrigerator. Uh, uh, I think it's very hard to kind of figure out, you know, which material goods enhance people's lives and which don't. Um, it's it's very subjective, uh, and uh, you know, I, I prefer uh, not to go there. I do, however, in the book look at you know, just the question of sort of quality of life uh, questions, uh, standard of living questions, rather. Um, you know, how does the middle class standard of living today compare to? in the 1970s, and, uh, and I was building in part on some really great work that uh, Bob Wessel and David, uh, uh, David Wessel and Bob Davis of the Wall Street Journal did in the late 1990s. Uh, and, and Elizabeth Warren has also done some work on this. And what you basically find is that the little things are cheaper and the big things are more expensive. Um, uh, education costs a lot more, cars cost a lot more, houses cost a lot more, healthcare costs a lot more. TVs are cheaper. 
Um, uh, so uh, uh, it seems to me if the big things are a lot more expensive, uh, that's a real problem. Let's go right here in the front. And then we'll go over here and then uh, one or two more possibly. Uh, I'm Pete Chutley from Brookings, and my question is these, this great divergence goes back to the end of the Carter years, and my question is why haven't the Democrats been able to make more political hay out of that? Well, I think that's the nut of it in a lot of ways. I mean, you can talk about whether it's income inequality, you can talk about the, you know, the tax fairness, economic fairness, and you see that when you often raise these que questions, which you know, sometimes from a political perspective are called populist issues, uh, you're accused of automatically of class warfare, and um, which is what they've done with the president, you know, for, you know, for the past few years. And the politics you know, of envy. You know, the pol yeah, the, that's the other cliche, the politics of envy. I have to interrupt just to say I did a blog item uh, a few months ago to try and clear this up. I said, you know, talking about income inequality is not class warfare. This is class warfare, and then I showed a little clip from the gangs of New York, the scene where they show the draft riots. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But yeah, you, you, you're lucky. You know, you, you know, if, if class warfare was was here, you'd really be in much more trouble. Uh, but Democrats seem to be pretty, you know, to be somewhat divided internally on how far to go down this road. You saw this just with Cory Booker and others questioning the Obama's questioning of Bain Capital. Um, I was talking to a fundraiser, a bundler for Obama recently, who said, you know, you know, one reason our side has so much trouble is that when I'm raising money for Obama, I'm really working against my own interests. You know, I'm w w working for higher taxes, so I'll have less, and I have to take a more, you know, a wider view of what my interests are and, and, and plug in communal good. And, you know, Republicans seem to be very aligned with their, you know, with, with, with sort of a greed is good, uh, let the markets uh, work, you know, let's not have, you know, we don't care about fairness, we, let's have creative destruction, rugged individualism, wherever you want to put it. Um, the, the Democratic Party, when, when you can go from Mark Warner to Paul Wellstone, that's a pretty wide ideological divide, you know, which, uh, which hasn't really shifted much in the last 30, 40 years. In the Republican Party, where you used to go from Nelson Rockefeller to Jesse Helms, you know, now you go from Jesse Helms to Michelle Bachman. And it's got, you know, it's moved to the right and it's gotten a lot more narrow. So I think the Democrats have always had this internal disagreement about how far to go in talking about this whole range of issues and how far to go in taxing the wealthy, how far to go in, you know, in, in, what, I, in, what, in what Roosevelt said and having the citizens get together to, you know, to check the mighty forces of commerce. And that is just, you know, since Roosevelt's day, you know, it's, it hasn't really gotten its, it, it, its act together in that front. And, um, and Democrats have, su have succeeded, you know, both taking a populist stance and not doing so. You, you know, there were you know, the pro-business Atari Democrats you know, and, and, and when Clinton ran, he was running as some guy, you know, as, as a new Democrat, like Mark Warner, who understood business, who could be a Democrat who could work with business. Dick Gebhardt, when he was the leader of the House, said, hey, there's the, there are all these industries out there that are not, that, that has new industries, that have not given money to the Republicans. So these will be our industries, Democratic industries. So, of course, we're not going to go after them and regulate them and talk about any issues that offend them. So a lot of issues, a lot, a lot goes into this, but um, it's, it's complicated. Well, I, I would also just add that, that um, uh, the fact that Mitt Romney, the Republican uh, now de facto nominee, uh, was uh, chairman of Bain Capital is a, a gift from God for Obama, I think, because um, you can be very pro-capitalist and still look ex askance at the, at the private equity uh, business because it's it's uh, it's a way to get rich without without uh, exposing yourself to risk. I mean, it's sort of hugely ironic. I think that this former partner of of Romney's has just published a book about how we need to throw more money uh, at rich people to encourage them to take risks. Because uh, the author Edward Conard, uh, 
he worked for Bain Capital. Bain Capital was, they did some venture capital, and that's laudable. But it mainly, it was a private equity firm, and the deal with private equity is you, 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 you load up some debt, you buy these companies, uh, and you rig the game so that if uh, the companies fail, uh, you still get a profit. And if the companies succeed, you get more profit. So you'd rather they succeed than that yeah, they yeah, fail. Yeah, yeah. But um, there is no downside risk. Uh, there is no risk of failure. Uh, and I'll throw in one, one thing, too. Mm -hmm. uh, having just read this biography of Romney, you know, he talks about how he left a secure job to you know, start this risky operation and become you know, a true entrepreneur in Bain Capital. He only took the job because the head of Bain Consulting guaranteed him his old job back at a promotion if Bain Capital didn't take off. So he, he risked absolutely nothing to go into a field where you're almost guaranteed to make money because you get money in, on the fees first, and then you get money on the profits if profits come. All right, let's uh, get a couple more comments here. Well, let's take them all together and then let them respond. We'll go here, here, and over here. And uh, let's see, Dave, you want to fix your mic? So I'm, 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 lose my mic. I'm, I'm, I'm so old that uh, I, 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 I grew up under President Eisenhower, when the when the when the top tax rate was ninety one percent, so it's certainly were you hard paying that tax rate? Huh? Were your were you or your parents paying that? No. no. <laughs> so it's hard to take the the argument whether it should be thirty three or thirty six percent seriously. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as, as class warfare, I think the I mean I, my feeling is that the Republicans basically have been playing class warfare, and you know a simple example of um, actually. Are the, are the trade agreements, which, which such, such as NAFTA, which uh, basically s send a lot of jobs op op overseas, and the result is that the, uh, the, the working class here uh, gets put in, in a, t t a terrible trap. Yeah, it's one of Tim's uh, culprits. You can talk about him then. Okay, let's go here and then over here. Thank you so much. I'm probably the only non-American here. I'm French and uh, resident in Norway. I came to the United States to set up a foundation to understand what we are talking today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I learned a lot. And I met the last five months both to right, left, and so on, authors like you. My understanding is, uh, what my opinion after working for European Commission and so on, is we are addressing the wrong context. Context I call agricultural society, industrial society, and we are now in knowledge economy. Basically, politically, my understanding or my assumption, working assumption is, uh, in knowledge economy, local democracy and individual empowerment are critical. And I was invited by Chinese government and my most important project this year is for Chinese to help them help work with them to understand this transition from industrial society to knowledge society. Now, in that respect, politically, I, what do you think about local democracy from village to state, and how can it play a multiplier effect? Because uh, your solutions are fireman solution. I'm provocative, yeah. okay? And I will even ask you to sign the book you wrote. But uh, you don't address structural adjustment from industrial society to knowledge society. And one of them is empower local democracy and individuals to address okay, political good, Yeah, good point. And then uh, right here in the front. Thank you. Um, it seems like a corollary to the question about mobility is that there's also a generational divide in some of these issues, and it felt like they're trying to get at that for a little while with the student loan questions. Right. And I'm wondering if um, demographics may in part just be on our side, and if in appealing to what will be an increasingly larger part of the electorate, we might be able to change some of the conversation about these inequality questions by simply hoping the bad guys die off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Uh, demographics are destiny, uh, eventually. Uh, you know, to, to address that point, I, I do think there is, a, there is a generational shift 
in terms of what we didn't even talk about much today, what I would call economic security. I, you know, for those of us of a certain age, there, uh, and from a certain class, but it, but it didn't have to be that high a class, but middle class, there was a certain presumption growing up that you could find a job, you could, you know, you could, you could have more or less what you wanted, if you got, you know, you maybe you get rich, maybe not, but that you wouldn't have to have a lot of mobility in terms of your job, you'd be able to have a family, and that, you know, you could have a stable life, more or less, from, uh, from whatever point you decide to settle down, whether it's when you're 25, 30, 35, whatever. And that, I think, is completely out the window for anybody who hasn't hit retirement yet. And uh, I think felt perhaps more poignantly the younger you go. And uh, I, the president is clearly trying to address some of that, uh, but I think it's, it's like e inequality, the notion of economic security is hard to you know, sort of fully define and hard to get at in a short-term, immediate way. But uh, it could be, uh, as he tries to address things like the student loan and education and investments, you know, in, a, in sort of a wide way, these are things that are good for all sorts of issues in sort of preserving the middle class, but also narrow the inequality gap. You know, maybe you don't go at it for that reason, but for other reasons, and it has that net effect. So, I mean, that's probably the, the most optimistic assessment I could have in that regard. Uh, Final words? I, I would answer with student, the student loan problem, I don't really think is a student loan problem per se. I think it's a cost of tuition problem. And um, the, what I thought writing my book was the most controversial policy uh, solution I proposed was I said we need uh, government price controls on uh, college tuition and fees. And I sent my manuscript off and uh, then I, uh, uh, while it was off at the, uh, at the printers, I sat down to watch the State of the Union address. Lo and behold, Barack Obama in the State of the Union doesn't say, doesn't call it, you know, uh, government price controls on college tuition and fees, but he called for essentially the same thing. He said he was putting colleges and universities on notice that if they can't get these costs under control, the federal government would use its leverage to make them, get their, them under control. Now, what was remarkable, and I'd love to ask you about this, David, is that um, Republicans who will call Obama a socialist yeah. at the drop of a hat left this one entirely alone. The best I can come up with are two plausible explanations. One is that uh, Republicans hate colleges and universities so much <laughs> that they love the idea of them getting beaten up by the president. Uh, and the other is that um, uh, Republicans send their kids to college and that they are as frightened as everybody else by the spiraling cost of a I don't think education. I don't think it's the latter there. I think, um, I, think I, I, I think they dropped the ball. I think in some ways I think they didn't they they probably didn't believe that he was serious or that it, or that maybe that it could even be done. Um, but I think if you put out a ten point plan for price controls in colleges, uh, you have you'd have Mitt Romney all over that pretty damn fast. Um, so it's, it's potentially it, 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 a campaign it, it, issue. It's, it, uh, it, it's for the there. Fall. It's there for the picking. Uh, but it also, you know, it gets back to the, what you asked about in terms of class warfare earlier too. Um, it just seems to me that there is this tremendously embedded portion of our political DNA, in which you know, you know, it goes back to the Palmer raids and goes back to that. Any time you talk about fairness, equality, you know. There is this automatic reply, you know, that it's basically communism. It's basically non-American. You know, what, you know, we've we've talked in the last few days in the political world about birtherism because Trump has brought it, you know, brought it back in the last two days. And Mitt Romney says, of course, he was born here. I don't believe any of this stuff. But what Mitt Romney has done again and again and again is to say that Obama has this government-centric vision for America. He wants to basically turn it into a European society where government does much, uh, does more, and that he doesn't believe in business and markets, and that he doesn't understand America. He doesn't get America. He doesn't believe America is unique or special. And it's all a way of playing into that same long tradition, that he's different, he's the other, that there are, there are real Americans, as Ted Nugent would say, and non-real Americans. 
and he's not a real American. And if you talk about this sort of stuff, it's not really American. And it's a kind of debate which the president acknowledges in a lot of his speeches. It's this, you know, this push and pull debate that we've had that goes back to the beginning of the nation. And um, I think Obama's, you know, not as good as TR, but has given a pretty good shot at trying to, you know, have the, and wage this debate from the progressive side as well as can be done at this point in our political culture. And I think it's a, it's a dangerous game, actually, for Romney to play, because I just saw a poll the other day that showed demonstrably there is more racial prejudice against Mormons. I mean, there's more prejudice uh, against Mormons than there is against African Americans. Uh, and it's a more socially acceptable prejudice. Uh, so if he wants to start calling Obama the other, uh, that's, you know, that's a, uh, an awkward uh, theme for him to sound. Well, both of these uh, books will be relevant for the uh, coming uh, campaign and debates uh, showdown by David Korn and The Great Divergence by Tim Noah. And uh, thank you both for being here and for you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.